initially when I saw the program, it, it felt onerous to follow after Patrick. Um, but I think <clears throat> based on what Patrick has shown, it's probably uh, a natural fit uh, of what I, will <coughs> I wanted to speak about anyway. Um, yeah, so um, I would like to talk uh, <coughs> about like the more uh, the background technological aspects. How do you think about that to coincide or correlate with like the kind of tectonism uh, aspects that Patrick specifically highlighted? Um, so in in many ways, like uh, my career or uh, work at Zaha has um, kind of uh, always tried to. Uh, balance these two aspects. There's the tech technological and like understanding uh, and, and try to match it with the discursive aspects of where the company is going and especially what Patrick was saying about parametricism. And so both Patrick and Philippe Bloch that Patrick mentioned, like they're uh, both my PhD advisors. Um, and uh, for the <clears throat> In, in the past few years, there have been like uh, Patrick talking about the congeniality as, as he did here, about uh, the congeniality of architect, uh, engineering to parametricism's uh, agenda, and Philippe Bloch himself like then uh, reciprocating that and like uh, kind of uh, suggesting how engineering thinking can be uh, augmented uh, by, by this kind of tech, particularly tectonic tectonism aspects of par parametricism. Um, <clears throat> again, this is not something like uh, only restricted to the past few years, like you can trace this uh, uh, kind of uh, productive uh, tension all the way at least back to, to uh, Italian Renaissance, the, the famous protagonist of Brunelleschi and Alberti. And Alberti was, if you will, a kind of architect's architect, more interested in the uh, visual and, and also the urban implications of buildings, whereas Brunelleschi was not really an architect, but he was more a te technologist of, of that time, like kind of inventing all the gear systems, etc., to get uh, the, the dome in Florence built. Um, so when we started like code in like 2007, like we did everything from um, designing like shoes with Lacoste, extending that kind of thinking as pa Patrick has shown um, <clears throat> on, onto the kind of larger scale structures, like this idea of systems thinking, like it's not about one, one tower, it's about like how, how you can think of the larger um, system even if you, if you only build one at, at a time. So, um, and along the way, like we have participated in like um, tower projects or shell projects or like small scale furniture aspects uh, or even product design. Um, uh, so to formalize that, like somehow we now think that code is trying to sit in between leading cutting edge research that's happening in industry uh, and also in academia like in the ITKE or in ETH. Uh, also some of the other research groups in, in, uh, in industry. Uh, and it's not restricted to only formal science or material science or physical science. Uh, we are increasingly trying to in improve our collaborative network uh, in the social science arena as well. Um, and we explicitly want to transfer some of uh, these thinking and make them available to designers uh, in, in the larger ecosystem of like the Zaha projects. Um, so we want to sit somewhere in between as the kind of catalyst or the uh, transfer, a transfer mechanism from industry to, to, to our projects. <clears throat> as um, over time, like um, as Patrick kind of indicated, like uh, we see code also has this kind of distinction of like what could be uh, called physically based design um, and, and, and how that is a necessary substrate for a socially based design, like how we can, um, and, and I'm going to predominantly talk about like the physically based design, the technical aspects a little bit and the hist its own history and how it could uh, kind of support the idea of tectonism. Um, uh, briefly mentioning the socially based design, like some of the technologies that we're trying to investigate. Uh, one of them is uh, like procurement of data and data forensics and data analysis like to, to figure out what kind of things people might like in the urban environment uh, through, through a kind of data-driven data methodology. 
and also across scales back into the interior scale, like uh, where they might congregate, uh, what, what might be the dwell time in relation to the architectural features, etc. Uh, uh, again, this is a kind of, we, we believe, complementary to Patrick's larger uh, research uh, that he mentioned in Vienna and else, elsewhere. Um, so this data aspect is, is in that sense, uh, complementary, and not, not in the sense of validating research, but also to, to unearth some things that uh, are kind of uh, curiosities or, or, or things that like uh, theory might miss uh, or, or peculiarities that will be latent in, in design, so in, that, uh, in data, in that sense, a kind of forensics. Um, <clears throat> so, again, it's not something that, like, uh, we are operating in a vacuum, uh, you know, we are extending the thinkings and writings and the work of people like Bill Hillier and uh, Julian Hansen, Alan Penn, etc., in the UCL. Uh, we are working with uh, other institutions now, trying to, institutions like Autodesk, like, which is a commercial company, they have interesting research going on in terms of, like, there's all of this physical uh, sensors about building performance, how can we translate that or do some kind of forensics and see what the people are doing in relation to the sensor information. So it's, uh, it's ubiquitous, like all of these sensors now, like, but like how we can translate that to understand if peop what people are doing, are they at their desk, are they having a conversation, um, et cetera. So because <clears throat> uh, privacy matters come into play when um, data is involved, so this kind of forensic activity is also in interesting in that sense. So we're working with uh, toy data sets, also real data sets that like provided to us by uh, companies like Autodesk uh, who, are, who have the infrastructure to collect this, this kind of data. So how can it convert like building sensor data into occupant behavior uh, simulations? Is, and subsequently then also make that information visible and available for designers to make critical decisions. Uh, it's, it's not enough like only to have forensics because it's mountains of data, uh, but like slowly work towards making digested and uh, display the critical informations. Uh, we are in very early stages of this. I have to mention we've been only working on this like for the last uh, eight, eight months to a year. Um, and so some of this is like the, the very early result of that, like what, what would be the occupant density, let's say, of if you move some of the furniture around, et cetera. So, but you can see the future tra trajectories um, that like we, this, this might take in relation to the agent-based uh, parametric semiology uh, research. So as I said, like that's, that's all I want to mention about the socially based design aspects, like and most of it, the rest of the presentation is gonna be about the history and, and the way we worked, uh, the aspects of the physically based design uh, in relation to the idea of making visible structural fabrication and environment rationality as uh, Patrick, Patrick might call that like tectonism. Uh, and what is the flip side of that, the technical, technical version of that, like, or in, in computer graphics uh, and, and uh, structural design, it might be called architectural geometry, um, which is geometry that already incorporates uh, the constraints and the, this, uh, the critical parameters of structure, fabrication, environment, and so on and so forth. So the presentation is gonna be mostly about the relationship between tectonism and architectural geometry in that sense. Um, as a research group over the last 10 years, uh, we have accrued several trajectories of uh, research interests, and most of them follow this pathway uh, that it might start with an interest, someone might suggest a topic, uh, but like it always uh, invariably passes through several design studies very quickly, and then we might try it out in a prototype or in a sculpture. And then we try it out again in a, a kind of internal competition, a small scale competition, large scale competition, et cetera. Um, and along the way, we also try and augment this kind of design research with like applied science research, like either by working with like uh, in the, um, ac <coughs> academia, like ETH or ITKE or University of Bath, et cetera. Uh, but the hope is always that they become 
over a period of gestation become available for deployment across uh, larger Zaha projects. Uh, I won't go into, I will only present three of these several uh, trajectories. Um, uh, in, in all of these, like we are heavily influenced by like computer graphics and research and uh, mathematical methods that come from um, animation industry and um, both in the simulation aspects, like that it is physically based, it is not physically exact. Uh, there's a difference that I would like to make because design only requires for things to be physically based, the, uh, the rest so that it becomes amenable to in intuition. Uh, and the physical exactness comes later down, down the stream uh, with engineering uh, software, etc. Uh, so we, we also incorporate a lot of uh, like mathematics that is applicable in computer graphics, in the design of characters, etc. Um, uh, in, into our design tool sets uh, because we believe that the animation industry is somewhat similar to architecture in the sense that there's a lot of technology hi hidden behind the storytelling uh, and, and uh, you have to match the technology with, uh, with the expressive necessities that designers or car uh, movie, movie makers and directors uh, need at their disposal. So for example, uh, a few examples of that is like uh, what we might call fabrication and or structure aware geometry, as I said, architectural geometry. Uh, in this case, uh, combining topology optimization with the fabrication technology of 3D printing. Uh, so making again visible how the chair works uh, through these venation patterns and also the density gradients, et cetera. Um, and we work with a, a startup company, uh, one of whom works for uh, Zaha and the other, uh, one of the founders worked for Zaha and the other uh, used to work for us. Um, and we did this uh, kind of 3D printing of uh, ABS plastic on, on uh, foam formwork uh, as a design exercise and, and also sculptural exercise uh, for the salon in, uh, this year in Milan. Now, <clears throat> previously, we have again worked with like other startups at, at that time, a startup like uh, in 2012 for the Venice Biennale. Uh, we worked with a company that did robotic folding, uh, but we developed all the design software and we worked with uh, at the machine level, like uh, generating uh, code to, to derive uh, physical expression, like design expression through, and that's our only interest to invest time in the, the machine parameters. It's like, what does it enable? Uh, on the design side. Um, and lot, uh, again, like with fabric structures, uh, working with the, the, the seam layout, et cetera. Uh, so these are not by accident like this. It's, it's by constant negotiation and conversation with very, very much downstream processes all the, all the way upstream. Um, so three things that I would like to highlight from our experiences over the, the last 10 years in like how we are trying to bridge uh, constantly negotiate tectonism and like its discursive uh, uh, agenda and objectives with like the, the technological aspects uh, of architectural geometry. Uh, I will uh, kind of illustrate these three points about computer-aided design, uh, how all of these efforts are particularly beneficial if it is guided by an uh, underlying idea of geometry. And also lastly about the cumulative collaborative network. Um, so starting with computer-aided geometric design, like it's more, uh, what I mean by that is like a kind of confluence of physics uh, as embedded in, in geometry. So thereby, you know, like designers have a lot of intuition of how things, how the physics might work, uh, like a fashion designer would know how a, a fabric would drape. Um, and if in the digital environment to capture that intuition, it's somewhat easier to work with geometry. So classic example is like the Bezier spline, which is physically, it's a, it's, it's a physical uh, elastic rod with hanging weights. And, but when, when it comes to the digital side of things, it's abstracted as a, uh, as a, as a geometric tool. Like it, the physics of it is actually hidden when you draw a NURBS curve in Rhino. Uh, but it is kind of the physics is captured as geometry uh, and geometrical parameters, and that's that's essentially what we are trying to say. Computer-aided geometric design that physics and manufacturing is captured as 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 geometry. 
extending that idea to uh, architectural scale is, is what is commonly known as uh, architectural geometry. Chief protagonists being like people like Helmut Potman, uh, Philip Bloch, uh, ITKE, uh, Akim Menges, etc. So they're all contributing to this kind of geometry that represents structure, fabrication, environmental rationality captured in an intuitive way, making it available for designers to, to really unleash or unlock the uh, expressive uh, potentials latent in these. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> to this, we are also adding uh, as, uh, as a code group, like some of the interactivity aspects coming from the animation industry, some of the uh, technologies coming from the animation industry to really amplify and accelerate this process. In the end, like we, we are fundamentally interested in exploring the design space associated with this, whether like Frey Otto did like several uh, decades ago with his uh, engineers and, and mathematicians at uh, ELEC in Stuttgart, and, and the way Philippe Bloch has been doing that uh, uh, through his own research team in ETH. Um, so one is compression-based design space, the other is ten tension-based design space, but you can imagine we can extend this to other forms of fabrication constraints, environmental constraints, etc. So what we want, what we ha uh, hope to make available, and this is tools that we have developed in-house in a way, combining these ideas um, and making them available for kind of real-time um, uh, manipulation, like while you move the cage, like you already see some kind of tensile fabric surface. Uh, we believe this real-time interactivity is key essential aspect of, of designing with these um, uh, technologies. Um, we also try to embed our own prototyping experience, the tacit knowledge that comes from physically making the, these kind of prototypes. This was already uh, several years ago, fabric, fabric guided. Um, and, uh, and, and the reinforcement, incidentally here, like there was like no drawing made like workers just follow the steepest path down. Uh, and it's that kind of intuition that we want to capture uh, in, in the digital tools. Um, and also how the seam layout might work, et cetera. So that, these are the reasons that we make prototypes. It's not to advance technology, but it's to capture uh, the expressive parameters, what can actually be expressed, uh, and what is critical to the functioning or fabrication aspect of, of these geometries. Uh, second aspect, like this common language of geometry, uh, we believe like really unifies multiple stakeholders like architects, engineers, contractors, uh, perhaps even clients in a way because uh, a lot of people understand uh, geometry, uh, fewer people understand numerical, analytical um, uh, technologies, let's say. And so <clears throat> I mentioned Newton because uh, he's perhaps the most famous for the invention of calculus, etc. But like his proofs for here in this case the orb, orbital uh, elliptical nature of orbits is purely based on like geometric proof. Like they, there's no actual calculus involved. Like a lot of his proofs uh, involve only geometry-based, uh, angle-based, or uh, simple uh, properties of geometry and triangles. Uh, this. Uh, contemporaries of Newton at that time, like Christopher Wren, architectural contemporaries, used similar methods to design things like uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, and m more famous protagonist of these met geometric methods is perhaps Gaudi himself, uh, who's kind of known for ha ha using the hanging chain, but like uh, he used that only once in, in one of the projects, but most of the time, architects of that time were using these geometric methods of structural calculations. Uh, what this also meant that like uh, it can be downstream propagated. Uh, you can um, instrument makers and tool makers can devise these kind of instruments uh, and also these kind of drawings called the trains for carpentry, etc. These are all they don't have to know anything about the physics uh, because it's all captured in these uh, geometrical constraints and instruments. Uh, so there was a thriving ecosystem of, like, let's say, design to production uh, already in the 18th, 19th century uh, Europe and also in other parts, but I'm, I'm not aware. Uh, I don't know much about other, other cultures, but um, the, the idea is it's a kind of geometry-based ecosystem of, like, design to production, fabrication, etc. 
Um, so the reason like I uh, approached Philip Block for, uh, to be my advisor is essentially because of this geometric base for structural calculations because it makes, it's one step closer to making this stuff visible uh, in physically built, uh, physically manifested geometries if like the underlying principles are geometric. So they're extending the original 2D graphic statics into 2.5D and fully 3D by now, and every time they put out a research paper, we, we quickly align our tool sets uh, to explore design potentials, adding fabrication constraints, et cetera. So this is a prototype we built. Uh, that animation is, is a research paper that uh, Philippe Bloch had put out uh, uh, through his researches, and we quickly assimilate this uh, into our own tool sets and uh, trying to make them available uh, for wider consumption. And also, uh, we make physical prototypes always to inform our uh, geometric intuition. So lastly, uh, all of this enables, in a way, a cumulative, collaborative, dense network of research in academia, in practice, in profession, um, and in, in other um, industries, cross-disciplinary um, research to contribute to, to the progress of our own discipline and our own profession. A uh, few things like I would like to mention, like the idea of uh, shell structures, like it's, uh, we've, in our own city of London, like uh, 2000, early 2000, people like Chris Williams in the University of Bath, working with Norman Foster, made accessible a lot of complex mathematics to uh, both engineers and architects, and uh, already in 2015, uh, some of the DRL graduates were working on this project. Uh, you can see the progress the uh, discipline is making um, in, in, in a span of few, um, because that paper on the, uh, on the left is like perhaps quite impossible for architects to digest, but Chris Williams and others obviously uh, help make this complex information available to, to um, uh, people from other disciplines. Uh, and similarly, as I mentioned already, Block Research Group uh, making complex structural design aspects like available through geometry and simple intuitive means uh, of design. Uh, Patrick already showed this. Uh, so it, it, it's already, all, they're also providing compelling physical uh, evidence that these things work. And, and I think that's uh, similar to ICD. Um, and this is very much fruitful and beneficial for people like us in, in uh, working in, in, in a uh, professional environment to see these kind of things uh, being built. Um, so we're working with uh, Philippe and, and his team to extend that to, to our own um, uh, tectonic uh, objectives, aspirations to express the workings, the inner workings of these things uh, physically. Um, especially the structural aspects and the stone laying aspects of, uh, of st uh, stereotomy. Uh, so all of this will be a pure compression based geometry, but somehow in, let's say, so-called Zaha language. Um, uh, another topic is uh, curve, curve folded, curved origami that we've been expanding like at least three to four years of prior research. Um, the earliest modern history of curved origami starts in, in, in Bauhaus. Uh, and people, uh, mathematicians and artists have picked it up in, in uh, MIT uh, now. Um, and um, both artists like Ron Resch on my right uh, and, and uh, mathematicians like David Huffman have equally contributed to the progress of, the, of, of this domain. Um, and people like Helmut Potman and others are contributing the mathematics and also uh, digital tools to explore this space because physically it's super simple. You just score some paper and fold. Uh, it is very much, and you get curvature for free. Everything comes for, from a sheet material. And plus, you get this wide variety of uh, what, what, what we might call the design space or the parametric family. Uh, and it's also, you can put this together by hand, like, uh, like both these eggs. Uh, we worked with students over three to four hours each uh, over a day, like we were able to manufacture this in India uh, with just a laser cutter. Um, and like, so we've been expand, expanding uh, effort to bring that intuition into our uh, digital realm of like using Maya or Rhino, et cetera, uh, try to capture that intuition, the capture of physics, 
uh, as geometric uh, operations. Uh, and this enables downstream production as well, how many bolts we need, where to put the seam layouts, et cetera. Um, so I would like to conclude with like one, in what we believe is an interim project that somehow uh, provides us motivation to keep going. Uh, it's a commercially manifest, uh, a project that is delivered on time and on budget and uh, has been um, well received, uh, which is very important. It's the Gallery for Mathematics. Since the time it opened, the gallery uh, has already welcomed a million visitors. Uh, and all aspects here were little, uh, like whether it's the fabric structure or the stone uh, concrete benches, the floor layout, uh, the floor pattern, the object layout, etc. Like were uh, our, cult our interim results for us in, in these res research uh, trajectories. So, for example, the fabric structures, like we've been, uh, they've been studied mathematically as minimal surfaces for for a long time. Um, we also inherited a lot of technologies and thinking aspects from uh, people uh, like Frey Otto, but also fabric tailoring aspects from computer graphics, et cetera, uh, to, to enable us to really work with uh, the, the, the tailors or, or the people who make the bent tubes, et cetera. Um, uh, also making physical prototypes uh, and understanding um, and a similar story with like the concrete benches, like uh, it is robotic uh, hot wire cutting of, of uh, foam, but like some of the descriptive geometries come all the way from like 18th century uh, French mathematics. So, um, and also this, this company was like a small startup like five, six years ago when we initiated collaboration with them. Um, there were three architects and like 15 robots uh, by now, there are 15 architects, or 15 people and 15 robots, so uh, we feel um, <clears throat> good that like, we are able to kind of gestate this collaborative aspects into like, uh, commercial projects. Uh, so to conclude, uh, for us, the, the progress that discipline has made over the last 10, 15 years, just like in, in the time that like, I'm aware of, uh, on the physically based uh, side of things, uh, we believe uh, is reflected in like the extensive amount of research that's published every year. Uh, this, these are just conferences from the last uh, few months of the 2016. Um, uh, exceptionally high quality and like things are um, reaching such advanced levels of like a very close to commercial application. Uh, in a way that uh, allows us as architects to focus on the social side much more uh, because the physically based side is like fully taken care of. Uh, and I would like to leave you with these videos um, which, which we believe like if like the technology aspects are kind of um, set to the background, like that's, that's a sign of uh, maturation of, of, the, of the discipline uh, on the physical side. Uh, and so we can begin to concentrate uh, on like uh, what people might do, um, how the object should be laid out uh, to e enhance the user's experience and not only concentrating on how to build it economically uh, or efficiently, etc. So uh, uh, Patrick briefly mentioned this. Uh, uh, so we are also contributing to kind of quantifying what the user experience might be like, what they see, what is the depth of field, uh, how long they might uh, persist at a certain object, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, if you, I hope I'm not overshot the time. Thank you. Thank you, Shajay. Uh, any questions from the publicum? Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, thank you for both to you and Patrick for amazing lectures. Uh, I was just wondering uh, the role of artificial intelligence in your office and in also kind of how it spreads into academia, and uh, how do you see it becoming more integrated aspect of. Uh, of a design process, in, uh, especially in parametricism in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, <clears throat> like, 
we, we believe that the, the underlying aspects of artificial intelligence is like, in, or the one of the roots of AI is in statistics and in data. I mean, there, it also has neurological, uh, neuroscience background uh, to some of the technological aspects. But in terms of actually, we believe that like in, in the opposite or in the interim period before machines fully take over, I don't know when that might be, uh, there is a rich period of uh, augmenting our own intelligence, like design intelligence through the use of machines and like the capacities of machines to, to have like, you know, uh, to, to communicate much faster between themselves than like we can. Um, so, but like we have our own uh, capacities like for processing different kinds of information, like visual information, like we are way better than like machines are, for example. So in that sense, um, yeah, we, we, we've, we believe there's a lot to be worked on in the, on the aspect of augmenting our intelligence. Um, and in, because ultimately like machines should be for us and not, not for them to take over. I mean, that's like at least my position to, to um, use, use all of these technologies and welcome them to, to uh, really help us be better designers and eventually actually build better buildings, right? So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Nobody? Come on. <laughs> Tomorrow you can ask. <laughs> Today you can ask. Okay, so maybe I have a question uh, that uh, at the beginning you showed the very interactive way of how to do a project. Yeah, it might be very interesting. Uh, are there any thoughts in the office to kind of uh, make these tools available also for the clients? Um, yeah, to some extent, yes. Uh, the through through we uh, are applications or uh, like. The idea of simplifying things through sliders, uh, but we I, we don't have any real examples yet. Uh, but the potential is latent because, like, so so for example, all of these videos, it's not that we are outsourcing them uh, to to uh, animation company. These these are our design tools. So in a way, these videos are made as sc screenshots, literally, like. Uh, so in that sense, the potential is latent to, to make at least some of this visible to, to clients, of course. Uh, but there is a certain amount of edu uh, prior, let's say, uh, education that needs to go into to, uh, um, helping clients uh, understand uh, these. But like, we are not client-facing uh, part of the company, so we don't... Uh, we don't have any physical, uh, actual examples of making them available, but for sure the, the potential is there, yeah. Thank you. So, oh yeah, we have one question. Then in the middle, the last one. Here. H Hello. <coughs> uh, I would like to ask you, uh, regarding the, the r robotic fabrication of your project, it seems to me like you, you are still kind of uh, standing, like uh, your fabrication consists of like digital fabrication of, of parts, but how about the physical assembly, the robotic assembly on site? Because yeah. it, seems, it seems still, it, it's like on the halfway, because it, you still need kind of some su supportive structures, but the, it's not fully robotized. So do you develop any <laughs> ideas about <laughs> Yeah, I would like to again point out that, like, I think that the core technologies uh, are perhaps the domain of people like uh, Moritz um, uh, and like uh, other research institution in uh, across the world. Like, w what we want to do is align our design tools with the, the critical potentials latent in these, or expressive potentials latent with uh, within. Um, fabrication or structural design technologies or environmental design technologies, etc. Um, having said that, like yeah, assembly aspects are being worked on. Like for at, at least uh, I, I'm privy to uh, when I go to ETH for uh, for reviews, etc. There are people like Gramatio and Kohler, for example. <clears throat> now that the base has been laid, 
uh, for robotic making, uh, uh, they are taking steps towards robotic assembly, uh, but the, the, the hard, uh, hardships are way, or the complexities are way more than the, the initial part of creation. Because, for example, uh, robots can make stuff more easily than repair stuff. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of their limitations. Like, it's easy to have a tailoring machine as opposed to a kind of, so, uh, I don't know, how, how do you call it, a darning machine, for example. Like, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank Thanks you very so much. Mm -hmm.